wonderful weekend, beautiful weather. It's starting to really feel like October out there, and um, I hope that change is, uh, is wonderful and good for you. I do hope you took note of um, <clears throat> one of Alan's announcements, all of them, but especially the one about a new small group that's beginning right after this service at the beginning of November. Uh, Carol is not with us. She's down with the little ones today. Carol Spicer um, is going to be uh, leading a group and just going to be a group, a small group uh, atmosphere, talking about our Christian journey, uh, talking about how God fits into that and having prayer together. And if you're not in a Bible study, a small group already, I'd encourage you to go and to, and to be a part of that group. And I think there are many here in, in, in this service and in our early service uh, who are not part of a small group, and that's so important to, um, to be becoming disciples. The way we become like Jesus is <clears throat> to share each other, other's journey. So you'll have this month to figure out all the little details about that, but I, I hope you'll, um, <clears throat> you'll join Carol in three or four weeks. Well, Mark, we've been looking at Mark for a while now this year, and you could use many um, statements about the gospel of Mark as a whole. You know, we, we've said it's, um, it's the essential gospel. That's what we've been saying all year. But I also think that, and I've been reminded as you read Jesus' journey as remembered by Mark through Peter's preaching, I think it could also be called, it's almost a gospel of interruptions, is that it just seems that many, many times whenever Jesus has a personal encounter with a man or a woman that has a great need, whether it's healing or whether it's to talk about their spiritual life, it seems that he's always being interrupted. He's always going somewhere else. Uh, he always, sometimes it seems, has other things on his mind or Mark will paint the picture that there's some more important things happening and what seems insignificant, Jesus is interrupted with something smaller. And that's what's happening in the story, the passage that Damon read to you today. Now, interruptions in our life, uh, normally we, we really don't welcome them, do we? Uh, especially when it's a person. Have, have you ever been <clears throat> um, in a hurry to go somewhere? You're, you know, you've gotten ready, you're at the last minute, and uh, you know, you, you've just got time really maybe to hop in the car, drive, and, and get to a, an important appointment, and maybe your cell phone rings or buzzes. You'll look down, and you see the caller ID on there, and you say, this is not going to be a quick conversation. It's somebody that likes to talk. It's somebody that always, uh, you know, just uh, wants to invade your time. It's sometimes important, but this is going to be an interruption. Or maybe you're at work, and uh, you have a, an important uh, deadline, a schedule, a meeting to go to, and you are interrupted. You're interrupted with a phone call. You're interrupted with somebody knocking at your door. You're, you're interrupted uh, with the, the pace of the day that you've laid out by an emergency that comes up. You know, think of just how that feels and how you've got to re-gear your heart, your mind, uh, your whole demeanor to focus on this interruption. And that's what's happening. The, that, that narrative begins by, we, we get the picture that Jesus is getting ready to begin his final trip to Jerusalem. He's making his final trip where he has got a lot on his mind. He's going to face opposition. He's going to face uh, deep questions by the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He's going to give his life on the cross. He is gearing up for something that's very momentous in his life and will change the course of the world's direction. And so he is, I think, laser-focused. And on as he begins this journey, he is interrupted by a young man. 
Now, we normally call him the young rich ruler because if you piece the stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in one of those Gospels, he is called a rich young ruler and another a young man. Here in Mark, it's a young man. But this young rich ruler interrupts Jesus thinking that he just has all the time in the world and Jesus does give him time and they have a brief conversation but is so important for what's going to happen after the cross and after the resurrection and really is going to give great meaning to what it means to follow Jesus. So I'm glad that Jesus took the time to have this little conversation. And in this conversation, what we're going to see is some uh, very important truths about Christianity. And we're going to see what Christianity, what following Jesus is not going to be about. We're going to see that Christianity is not a sentimental passion, that Christianity is not gaining respectability, and Christianity is certainly not self-centeredness. And this conversation is going to remind us about all of that. First of all, Christianity, following Jesus, is not about having a sentimental passion about religion and faith and feeling good. There's no doubt that the young man in this story is searching for something. He is. I see him as a troubled young man. I see him as a, as a man that, that on the surface is, it's going to come out that it appears he has everything going for him, but he's missing something inside. He's not complete in his soul. He's kind of like um, the men on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. Is they're looking, they're searching for something, and, and after Jesus, who they don't recognize at first, walks and talks with them all day till they get to that little house and they break bread together and they realize it's Jesus. And then Jesus just moves on in his spirit to go somewhere else. And one man will say to another, did not our hearts burn within us while, we, while he talked with us? And at some point in each of our lives, that's the role of the Holy Spirit. In each of our lives, no matter where we are in life or how, how much we, success we think we have or how settled we think we are, how much we think we've learned, the Holy Spirit will begin to convict us. The Holy Spirit will begin to let us know that even though maybe it appears we have it all, we lack something inside us. And if we could find that something, we would feel complete in life. We would feel complete. That is the position the young man is in. And he, what he tells Jesus is, he says, basically, Jesus, what I'm searching for is eternal life. What I feel that's missing is the eternal. Now, I don't believe that this young man is worrying about death and about living forever or what's going to happen after he dies because he's so young. And like most young people, and when we were young, we don't think about things like that, do we? We think we're going to live forever. That life is, is just going to go on and on and on. As we get older, we realize with um, the um, occasions and, and the strain of life itself and seeing our loved ones maybe pass on before us that there are no guarantees in life. And we, we come to confront our own mortality. But usually when we're young, we just think life is a game and it's forever. So I don't think he's thinking about life after death, but what he was searching for is that he felt this need to get the eternal into his life. Does you see the difference? He wants the eternal. He wants God, who is eternal. He wants that into his life now. That's what he feels is going to make him complete. He wants to, to feel that he belongs to God. 
that he's connected with God. He wants to feel like, even with all that he has, that he has a a day-to-day fellowship with the creator of this universe. The young man, I believe, in the story is looking for peace in life. He's, He's looking for a wholeness in living. He's looking for purpose. He's looking for joy, satisfaction, and he's looking for peace in his heart and his peace with God. And whatever age we are, you may have come to that point where you've struggled with that before, haven't you? What's going to bring me that peace? And man, we can try all kinds of things to get that peace, to make that connection, to to, to find and that we're connected with the eternal. And the eternal is into our life. And that's really what he's struggling with. But he's not searching through his heart. And, and instead, as, as the narrative goes on, we, we realize that he's, he's carried away with the passion, the dream, the idea of what he wants. But he's not counting the cost. He's not counting what it's really going to take to have that peace of having the eternal God in him and alive. You see, what he's not realizing is that there is a difference between lordship and belief, isn't there? There's a difference between lordship and belief. You cannot live as a Christian. You cannot be a follower of Christ through just a sentimental passion or even just a sentimental belief. You must look to God in your sinfulness and make Christ Lord of your life. Now, I've heard some pastors, preachers, theologians will try to simplify the gospel. It is a simple way to find salvation, but some will will just strip everything away and say, all you need to do is, is believe in just these few facts about Jesus. If you can believe that he's just the son of God, that he died on the cross, that he, resur- he was resurrected, and if you say this patented prayer that I'm going to say to you and you repeat it, you're saved. If you've been in church enough, you've been in those services, haven't you? If you've been caught and had to watch messages on TV on a Sunday morning, you've heard those messages. But friends, don't be deceived. Salvation is more than just belief. In fact, one verse in James always wakes me up and makes me think about that. James Chapter 2, verse 19 says this, You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Satan knows that there is a God. Satan believes in God and he don't like it. But salvation is more lordship. It's, it is believing that Jesus died for your sin. But it's also surrender to him because of that and make him lord of your life. There's a difference in belief and following through and giving and surrendering. It's like um, um, flying in an airplane. I'm not the greatest flyer. I've learned to get on the airplane especially when Tammy makes me. And um, we, got, we want to get somewhere. Sometimes you got to fly. Now, I, I know, I believe that planes can fly, right? I see them. They're up in the sky, you know, thousands of planes fly, and there's hardly ever any accidents. Um, they, it's safer to, I know it's safer to get in an airplane than to get on my car and get on 95 to D.C. and back, Okay? I've got a, you know, hundred times better chance of not getting in an act, thousand times. I can believe all that I want, but until I get, go through the ramp and into the airplane and get in the seat and buckle up, 
I don't believe in that airplane, do I? There's a difference in believing from afar and giving my life, putting my life into what I believe. That's the difference that we're having in this conversation with this young man and Jesus, isn't it? There's a difference between lordship and just simple belief. Jesus says in this conversation, too, he says, you know, only God is good. Why do you call me good? You know, the man says, oh, you know, uh, good, good rabbi. <laughs> and Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. That's his first response. It's, it's meant to wake this guy up. It's meant to arouse him. It's, it's like when um, someone, um, uh, you, you're kind of out of it in the days and somebody throws cold water in your face. It wakes you up. It startles you. It kind of brings you to thinking again. It, this response to this man as it wakes him up to the truth, saying that people are good only when God is inside them shining out. People are not good by themselves. Have you watched enough news this week to realize that? People are not good by themselves when we try to figure out everything on our own. It's like the broken vessel illustration that Paul will, will write later about in 2 Corinthians that the best we are, even as believers, are crackpots. I guess we could be crackpots. Yeah, that, that, that'd work too. The best we can be with Jesus are cracked vessels. We, we still are sinned. We're still scarred. But the great thing is with Jesus inside us, uh, Jesus can shine through those cracked pots. And we have that blessing. The young man did not know Jesus well enough to be certain that he was good, that Jesus was good. But he did see God shining through Jesus. And Jesus was perfect. We do not do good out of our own efforts, but goodness is what flows out of our abiding relationship with Christ. We can only be good in God's eyes when Jesus shines through us. We need to remember that. Also, Christianity is not about respectability. Jesus' second response was to mention uh, part of the Ten Commandments. And, you know, he says, uh, well, if you want eternal life, you know, you've known as a boy. Here you do these things. And, and he mentions only part of the Ten Commandments, doesn't he? Did you, did you realize that? He mentions the commandments that deal with we as men and women, how we live out life with each other, how we treat each other. These are the behaviors that one must have to lead a decent life that God gave to Moses. And the young man responds by saying, boy, since I was a boy, basically, I've known this. I've heard this all my life, and I have been faithful in doing these things since childhood. As Dr. Bob said this morning, that's just a big fat lie. No way he... Uh, he, he did all those things all his life, but he felt like he does. In other words, he, had, he felt like, I've lived a life that I've really done no harm to anybody else. Don't you feel like that sometimes? You, most of you, all of us here, I think, are good people. We don't hurt anybody else. We don't harm anybody. We don't intentionally try to hurt somebody. Most of the time, though, that someone says they've They've done no one any harm. It's probably safe to say they haven't done anyone any good either. They're just living a safe life. And that was the real reason that Jesus was responding this way. He wanted the man to realize that it's not just being safe and harmless that matters, but it is a life of service because of what Jesus has done for us that counts. The real question was, what have you really done? What have you really done? Not really what have you not done. 
You have all of these possessions and wealth, he's beginning to say to this young man. What if, how have you used this wealth to help anybody? Good, you hadn't murdered anybody, hadn't stolen from anybody, hadn't bared false witness to anybody. But what have you done? That's what you're supposed to do. We're not supposed to do those things. Many of us here would, I think, could answer in pretty good confidence that we're not guilty of most of those heinous commandments that Jesus mentioned, right? We're good people. Jesus said, if you want the eternal in you, you're really not. You've got to go deeper. The young man feels the way to salvation, in other words, is being good. And we've heard that all of our life. We've been in church all of our life. It's, it's good works. And how many of us look back over our lives and we're satisfied with the way we've lived? We, but as one old-style preacher said, what we really need to do is go down to the depths of our soul and to the dark dungeons of our lives with the candle of the Lord. And then we know we need to repent so that we can really have the eternal life with God that we're seeking. And of course, finally, Christianity is not self-centeredness. Spurgeon once said, the great preacher, I have now concentrated all my prayers into one, and that one prayer is this, that I may die to self and live wholly for him. That's what Jesus is trying to get across. And he begins by, this is why I know that Jesus is not condemning this young man. He's trying to get him to follow him. The Bible says, after this beginning conversation, Jesus looks at him and felt a love for him. Isn't that comforting? It's an appeal for love, not anger, but a love that wanted the man to follow him. It was a challenge of love for this man to, to strike out on the great adventure of following Jesus. It was a look of grief, Jesus grieving when, when this man and we refused to follow him all the way and realize the greatest joy we can have as followers of Jesus. And so then he hits him, because Jesus knew the real problem, isn't it? Then he hits him. He loved him, and he said, you know, you're doing great. Here's the one thing you lack to have the eternal. Go sell all you have and give it to the poor. And I think the man knew that before he came to Jesus, don't you? The Bible says that that his face fell, and he went away. Can't you imagine the sad picture, the rich young man's face falling? Hope went out of his heart. Light faded from his eager face. The same man who had run to him with great expectations now walked away, head hanging, full of grief. And when Jesus finally brought him face to face with what really kept him from the eternal, it was his love of money. And he said, like many of us say, I desire eternal life. I desire the life of the apostles and the New Testament. I desire to know the miracles of God. But I just cannot give up the things dearest to me. And so he went away and kept his earthly possessions. But he lost Christ. And that is a sad way to walk away. The man's tragedy was that he loved things more than Jesus. He loved himself more than others. And it begs us to ask, what keeps us from having the eternal in our life more? From having all the great relationship we can have with Jesus it's like the young man was, was in a raging river, drowning, and Jesus shows up on the side of the river and, 
and says, here I am. And he tosses the life preserver out in the river and the man looks at the life preserver and he thinks about it, but then he looks away and doesn't take the salvation that Jesus is offering. He'd rather drown than change. So where are you in your life? You know, one great symbol that Jesus left us to think about that is to remind us all that he's done for us, isn't it? He left us communion. He left us on the night that he was betrayed when he broke the bread and he said, remember, this is my body given for you. When he took the cup and he said, drink and, and, and remember, this is my blood shed for you so that you can have the eternal inside of you now. Eternity begins when we really believe in Jesus and making Lord of our life. And that's why he says, do this often in remembrance of me. When you take the bread and you, and you take the cup, remember what I've done for you so that you can complete yourself. And so we are going to do the same. After my prayer, um, you can come up to either station and take the bread and accept the bread and accept the blood of Jesus to remind you what Jesus has done for you, to remind yourself that the eternal is there inside of you. Let's pray before we take communion together. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for making it possible that we can complete our life and become whole. Lord, um, as we partake now of uh, and remembering what you did for us on the cross and what you did for us in the shedding of your blood, may this be a holy moment when we commit to you as Lord of our life. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.